Good evening. Good evening. Are you nervous? <laughs> no. It's lovely to see you, and it's lovely to be here. I praise the Lord, and I thank the Lord for, for the cross. And uh, it's lovely to have a testimony to the saving grace of my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ, to share with you this evening. And I am a bit nervous, so... Uh, uh, if you have the Word of God with you, uh, if you will come with me to Second Corinthians. The Second Corinthians chapter 4. In Second Corinthians chapter 4, and we'll commence at verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commencing ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our God be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, and whom the God of this world, that is Satan, have blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And friends, if you just skate over there to chapter 5 of 2 Corinthians and 1 verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away, and behold, all things are become new. And then there's another word of Scripture, friends, that has come to my heart over the past days and weeks as I'm drive my lorry around the country. And it's Amos 4, and verse 12. Prepare ye to meet thy God. In verse 3 of chapter 4, Second Corinthians, but if our gospel be hid, and friends, the gospel was hid from me for 17 years of my life. For I was brought up in the teachings and the doctrines of the Catholic Church. It goes on to say in that verse, it is hid to them that are lost. I was lost. We're all lost. In verse 6, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. And I praise the Lord that the light of Christ shined into that dark place. And shined into that dark place of my heart. Just to give you a wee bit of a background of the teachings of the Catholic Church. My mother was a devoted Roman Catholic. I'm the eldest of nine, of five brothers and three sisters. And my mother made sure that her children were found to be in the chapel on a Sunday morning. And any holy day that there was in the Catholic Church calendar, we were to be at the chapel. She also made sure that we went to the confessions on a Saturday, the confession boxes, talk about it. And in the chapel in Cookstown, down the side, as you come in through the doors down the side, there's three boxes on the other side. The priest bees in the center box, and people are sitting in the pews waiting for their turn to go into the confession box to confess your sins. And we would have done this every Saturday, going to the confession box. But I suppose when I reached the age of 14 or 15, I schemed I wouldn't have went to the confession box on a Saturday. And I maybe wouldn't have went till for about three months. But then I would have went to it. And I darn't have told the priest that it was three months from my last confession. So I told a lie straight away, and I told him that it was two weeks since my last confession. So I told a lie straight away. 
And depend on the volume of your sins, the, the priest gave you penance. And whenever you went out into the sanctuary of the church, you had so many Hail Marys to say and so many Our Fathers to say. When I left the chapel and was going down the hill, if I was to cross the road and got knocked down and was killed, Tony Kelly was going to be in hell. My mother got me a wee part-time job when I was about 11 years of age, uh, working in a supermarket after school. And it was a family-run supermarket. It was called Milligan's Supermarket. And I was the only Roman Catholic that worked in that supermarket. And them times we were brought up in the troubles, and the troubles and all the rest of it, but I worked in there, and I was the only Roman Catholic. But we all got on. Everybody got on. And I worked there, and at the age of 17, Jim Mulligan, he offered me a full-time job in the supermarket as a, super, as a store man. And it was there that I met my wife, uh, Margaret. And I was very attentive to Margaret. I, I, I met Margaret, and uh, a relationship grew in between the soap powder section and the dog food section. For Margaret, she was it. And I would have been very attentive to Margaret. I would have went to the store and brought out all the stuff and all for and tore it to pack onto the shelves. And the relationship grew to the extent that I met Margaret at the age of 17 and we got engaged at 18 and we married at 19. My family all knew of this relationship and uh, I told my family that I was got engaged. And in the chapel at that time, at that year, when I was raised 18, there was a mission. And the mission was being taken by monks. Now, I don't know where they came from. But the mission was taken by monks. And we had to be at the chapel at 6 o'clock in the morning, every morning, every day for the first week. And then we were to be there at 6 o'clock every evening for the second week. And we were attentive to that mission every morning and every night. My mother would have went to first mass, and there's four masses that takes place in the Catholic Church in, in, in Cookstown. My father and the brothers and sisters, they would have went to last mass. But why was there four masses in the chapel in Cookstown? Friends, it was to accommodate the multitude of people. And yet today, our churches are empty and our churches are closing. My mother thought it was in her heart, and she went to one of these monks to come and to pay a visit to me uh, whenever the mission was over. And I was sitting in the living room of her home with my brothers and sisters were watching TV, and my mother opened up the door and told every, all of us to, to get out. All got out. I was the last one to follow them out. And my mother says, no, you stay there. And I sat there for a good five, ten minutes. I didn't know what was happening or what was going on. And the door opened and this six-foot monk came walking in. And he had the brown ground and the hood and all the rest of it. And he had the biggest set of rosary beads as a belt that was wrapped around his waist. And at the, at the bottom of the, of the rosary beads was a, a cross. That man came to talk to me, not of out of marrying this Protestant girl, but for not to, I didn't want me to be leaving the Catholic Church. But I listened to him and I says, look, I have met this girl, I love this girl, I'm engaged to this girl, and I'm going to marry this girl. And that was the end of the conversation. He got up and he, he left. We married. The invitations was given out. And all my family, my, my aunts and uncles and my parents and family, they all came to the wedding. My father-in-law had given us a wee bit of land as a, a wedding present. And I had moved my occupation from working in the supermarket to the cheese factory in Cookstown and was earning good money. I, I came from earning £30 a week 
which 15 of it I handed into the house. I worked in the cheese factory and you worked 12 hour shifts and all the rest of it and you were working weekends and you were getting time and a half and double time. And I went up to collect my check the first week, after the first week's work. And I went up to get my check and I went down into the restroom, whatever, my father-in-law was sitting beside me. And I opened up the check and I looked at him and I says, how am I going to spend this? The amount of money. I must have had nearly 300 pounds. I was shocked. But how and ever, as I say, we earned the money and we began to build a house. And we built a house and we started a family. Uh, we were living in a caravan till the house was built and completed. But we moved into the house and it wasn't finished. Uh, doors had to be hung and skirting board had to be put on and all. So uh, we moved into the house. And... Uh, our first child was born. Uh, we were living in a caravan. Our first, ch first child was born. And you know, has God got a sense of humor? Yes, I believe he has. Because there I was, a Roman Catholic, as war, marrying a Protestant, and my first child was born on the 12th of July. <laughs> to the excitement of my mother-in-law, because whenever I came home from the hospital and I went to into my mother's lost home and all the rest of it. She was sitting there and she was that excited and all. And she says, Tony, we're going to call him Billy. <laughs> Billy, or uh, my, my mother-in-law, she loved uh, the pipe bands and she loved the Billy Breast pipe band. And she says, we're going to call him Billy. I says, no, Peggy, we're not. And she says, and I, I know it, it doesn't make any difference. She says, well, will you meet me halfway and we'll call him William. So she kind of determined to get me into uh, naming him Billy or William. So I went and uh, went down to the hospital the next day or whatever, and I was telling my wife about this and all the rest of it. So we had a discussion, and we did give him a name, and we called him Mark Lee <coughs> William. <laughs> so put William in there, and I think it was the best thing ever done because me and the mother-in-law, the relationship that we had, we never had a cross word with each other or anything, or we never argued and never had, and I think, I think it was the best thing I ever done. As I say, there we were, we're setting up a home and we're rearing a, a wee small family. Mark, he was born on the 12th of July, and our second child, Tanya, was born on, uh, our second child, Tanya, a daughter, was born in 1985. As I say, there we were, rearing a family and all the rest of it, and uh, working at her home. I'd moved my occupation again. I'd moved from the cheese factory to work in uh, the pig factory in Cookstown, Unipork. And uh, in 1992, when I was coming home from work, uh, my wife met me at the door and uh, she told me that she received results uh, that she had cancer. My wife, through self-examination, she discovered a, a lump, and Margaret had breast cancer. She went to Beaver Park and was through the operations and got the lump and all removed and glands and got the treatment, the chemotherapy and radiotherapy and all the rest of it. But as while Margaret was in Beaver Park Hospital, there was these two Christian women who were going around visitations. And one of these Christian women approached my, uh, my wife and, and asked her, would you like me to pray with you and give her a wee track and all. Margaret had come home from the hospital and another Christian woman had given her the phone number of a man by the name of Dennis Galt. And Margaret, she had rang Dennis Galt. Uh, I, I didn't know anything about this, but Margaret had rang Dennis Galt. And I came home from work, and Margaret had told me that she had rang this Christian man and talked to this Christian man, and that man led my wife to the Lord over the phone. And when I came home, Margaret, she told me, she says, Tony, I got saved. What that mean to me? Been saved. Didn't mean anything to me whatsoever. I was never told about why Christ went to the cross of Calvary. 
I was told why he died in my place instead. I wasn't told that he resurrected and was ascended into heaven. I wasn't told. But I didn't know what this, what meant to be saved, but I seen a complete change in my wife's complexion. As I say, I was working in Unipork and I was going down a bad road. I'd been out with my so-called friends at the weekend and taking a drink. And when I heard this news of cancer, how did I cope with it to my shame? Drink. I went down that road of drink. And I mean, people, I was seriously down that road of drink. I was, near, I was an alcoholic. And Margaret, she had noticed that I was going through this period of taking drink and all the rest of it. And she talked to me and she says, you know, Tony, you're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to pull away and stop drinking so much or whatever. And I says, well, it's all right, Margaret, I will. I'll, I'll do that. And I did. I didn't go out at night and all the rest of it. But I substituted because whenever I come home from work, I went into the off license and would have bought a bottle of vodka and strong cider and all the rest of it. Whenever my wife went to bed and the Wayans went to bed and all then, I had a drink there. I would have hid the bottles, hid the evidence as it were. But when I came home from work the next day, my wife through housekeeping and cleaning the house and all the rest of it, she found these bottles. I know that Margaret was praying for me. I did go out one night and I got so drunk and whenever I came home and I was sitting at the side of the bed to get on change to get into bed and Margaret thought, right, this is the right time, this is the right time and she gave me the wee track that was given to her by the Christian woman in Beaver Park Hospital. And I opened up that track and I tried to read it and then I got tearful and then in anger, I ripped that track into a hundred pieces. And just like confetti, I just threw it into my wife's face as she lay in that bed. Margaret was still praying on for me. There was a church service, or the church that I was attending, there was uh, being renovated or whatever, and there was a service being held in the church hall. And the minister was given a testimony of a young girl who got saved at the age of 14. And she grew up and she married this fella, I suppose, unequally yoked. And this husband was an alcoholic. But that woman prayed for 30 years that her husband would get saved. And he did. And as I listened to that testimony that was given to me, that was given to us by the minister, I sat there and I said to myself, you know, Margaret's praying for me. But I don't want her to be praying for me for 30 years. My heart was touched. After the service, uh, I came and I sat in the car in the car park. Everybody was all going out and the minister, he came to lock the doors and I went over to him. Mr. Boyd, I says, today I want to give my life to Christ. And we went upstairs and friends, I knelt at the cross of Calvary. I knelt at the cross of Calvary and I got saved. I left the hall and was getting into the car. Margaret, she wasn't out of church that morning. She was driving up, it was only about a mile. Our house was only for about a mile, mile and a half from the church. As I say, she was not church. She, as I went into the house and into the kitchen, she was at the window. She had her back to me. She was preparing the dinner. And I just went over and I just put my arms around her and I didn't say anything. And Margaret says, Tony, you got saved. I says, Margaret, I did. So Margaret, she was putting the dinner right onto the plate and onto the table. And I says, no, Margaret, there's something I have to do. And I drove in home. As I say, my father and all and the rest of the family were at last mass. My mother, she was there. 
And when I says, Mom, I got saved today. And my mom's reaction was the same reaction whenever Margaret told me she could save. Mom didn't know. Didn't understand anything about it. But I told her I got saved. Through time, my mother was taken into a nursing home. My father was taken into a nursing home as well. And Wednesday night was my night to go to visit my parents. But this Wednesday night, I went to visit my mother. And there was a brother and sister was there too. We were taking turns about Wednesday night was my night. And somebody else was Thursday night, whatever. But there was two, my brother and sister was there. My mother was lying there in the bed. And we are just sharing with all her the way we were brought up. Because we had nothing. And the way we were brought up and the how we were brought up and all the rest of it and all the circumstances and all. And we were telling stories and my mother, she was lying and she was just laughing. And uh, so that was all right. I made my way home then. And I got home and I was in the bed and I was just about to fall asleep and the phone rang and Margaret, she answered it. And she says, Tony, uh, you may go into the home. There's an ambulance has been called. So I went into the home, and sure enough, there the ambulance was there, and they're putting my mother into the ambulance. The rest of the family started together, so we followed the ambulance down to Antrim Hospital. In Antrim Hospital, the ambulance pulled up. My family, my brothers and sisters, they went into the hospital. I was supposed to go to the family room or whatever. But I stood there and waited until the ambulance men opened up the doors, and they went in, and they were taking my mother out. And I looked at my mother. And I says, Mom, this is going to be your last time. This is going to be your last time on this earth. So they took her into a wee room and they put her into, wired up to a heart monitor and, and all the rest of it. And I went into the family room, my brothers and sisters, and a, wee, a young doctor, he came in. And he says, your mom's in a, in a room here, whatever. Do you want to get a priest or a minister? And a sister of mine, she stood up and she says, yes, get a priest, and quick, quick, get a priest. And I stood up in anger and I says, what do you want to get a priest for? What's a priest going to do? And then I sat down and I composed myself and I stood up and I apologized. And he says, look, if you want to go and get a priest, that's all right, go and get a priest. But I said to the young doctor, I says, I'd like to go and see my mum. And I went in, and there she was lying there, and heart monitors going. But some months previous to the situation that we now found ourselves in, I was reading scriptures, and I began to memorize this passage of scripture. I started to memorize it. And so as I was standing at the side of my mother, I just linked down, I medically told the hearings the last to go. And I just bent down and I just prayerfully prayed the word of Scripture that I'd learnt. Let not your heart be troubled. If ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you so. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come back again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas couldn't understand this saying, so he said, but Lord, we don't know where thou goest, and we don't know the way. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth and the life. And no one comes on to the Father but by me. And as I stood up, my brothers and sisters were behind me with the priest. And I left, and went outside. Five minutes, my family came out. Friends, I witnessed my mother going into eternity. My mother was gone. I praise the Lord for times that he gave me opportunities to witness to my brothers and my sisters 
and even to my mother and my father, they're now gone. Most of my aunts and my uncles are gone. I suppose in many ways I'm an orphan. But I'm a child of God. And you know, friends, as I was sharing my testimony with you, there's hundreds and thousands of Roman Catholic people in the pits of hell crying out, why does somebody not tell me? And there's hundreds and thousands of Protestant people in the pits of hell and they're crying out, why did I not listen? Friends, I'm not a Roman Catholic and I am not a Protestant. I am a sinner saved by the grace of God. And the Bible tells me that of those who hear the truth, the truth shall set them free. And I thank the Lord that I heard the gospel. And friend, you here this evening, if you're not saved, and you've heard the gospel time and time and time again, you should be ashamed of yourselves because the Catholic people are not hearing the gospel. You know the way. And if you're not saved, what's holding you back? What's holding you back? There's a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. Amos chapter 4, verse 12. Prepare ye to meet thy God. Friends, I believe we're living in end times. And there's going to come a time that the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more. And friend, are you that's not saved, you're going to be left behind. You're going to be left behind. The gospel, it's serious. Hell is real. But heaven's real too. Where do you want to spend eternity? Amen.